celebrated Martin Luther's birthday this week on the 10th. We had a national holiday so that we could all celebrate. And uh, uh, Martin would have been 540 years old at this time. Um, let us begin with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the institution of marriage. It is truly a blessing when one man and one woman come together to become one in you. We pray that each man may be a blessing to his wife, and we pray that each woman may be a blessing to her husband. Amen. I'm going to start out today with something a little bit different in that I was looking at what other people have done on on uh, discussing uh, Catherine Munro's life, and one a lady started out with a uh, reading from Proverbs, and I thought it was so good that we ought to take a look at that. So, the first no, neither neither direction seems to work. Oh, do I have to turn it on? Well, maybe. Probably. Yep. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> anyhow, this lady um, re read the. Oops, the wrong way. Do I have to do it again to hit? There it is. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 31, I'm going to start by reading. Starting in verse 10. Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with pure hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her training is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies merchants with sashes. She's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her saying, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Well, I thought that, <coughs> that was a very good description of Katie Luther, um, and of, of my wife and your wife, uh, too, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, certainly, it was a, a good description of Katie Luther. She did all of those things. <clears throat> Anyhow, let's start at the beginning uh, with her family. Um, her, uh, her father was Hans von Bora, and nobody knows the, her mother's name, um, or at least I haven't been able to find it. I could come up with some de deductions based on who her aunt was, but... Anyhow, uh, she uh, died, Katie died shortly after, or Katie's mother died shortly after she was born. Uh, she was born on January 29th in Lippen, Lippendorf, Germany. 
And then her father remarried after her mother died. <coughs> and it, it, it may be that um, the, the new wife wanted to get, to get rid of Katie, but, or that uh, we don't know why, but shortly after that, Katie was sent to the uh, cloister at um, Brenna at the age four or five. It could be that the, that the children of noble, poor noblemen, noblemen, if they didn't have a dowry, their daughters didn't have much chance in life. And it was pretty common for them just to put them in a, a cloister to serve God that way. Um, but the, the reason they said was to be cared for and educated. Um, her aunt Lena was the abbess in charge of that, that uh, convent. <clears throat> at, eight, at age nine, her aunt and her moved to a new convent that was the, called the, it's the, no, I can't pronounce it now, Christi, Christi, Christi. convent of Nip, at Nimption. Both of these convents were a Benedictine uh, order. And so it was, probably was no, nothing unusual that they moved to another one of the Benedictine convents. But this one was a very wealthy convent and um, it had a lot of land and good farmland. It was a, a, what we call bottomland, very, very close to a little stream that flowed through there. Uh, so they, they were able to grow, produce a lot. She learned practical farming and uh, German language and Latin language while she was there. Uh, the convent was a typical place for noblemen's daughters. Um, and her aunt, Lena, was a noble, from a noble family also. She was uh, from Staupitz, the same as, remember Luther, a mentor for years that got him out of the depression and, and taught him uh, the, how to find the right passages in the Bible. His name was Stau, von Staupitz also. So she may have been this, of the same family. <coughs> uh, Katie took her vows as a nun at age 16 and started to wear the veil. And the nearest town to Nimption, the cloister, was uh, Grima. And Luther uh, traveled to Grima and preached there. And in fact, uh, left some, one of his books was given to a man there. And um, well, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, what did he preach? Well, he taught justification by faith as the main thing that he was teaching. Oops, and ahead. So, um, one of the, he at this time he was already talking about the the pitfalls of the monastic life or the or the convent life, and um, that he talked about that. He talked about marriages, the realization of life as God intended it. And uh, I can't read the last sentence there. The continuance in cloister is incompatible with salvation. Oh, thank you. Uh, obviously, that would have been a pretty dramatic thing to say in a town that hosted a, clo hosted a cloister. And uh, one of the townspeople there was Wolfgang von Stahl, who got a copy of one of Luther's books. And he had two nieces that were in the convent. Their names were Margaret and Veronica. And uh, they, he snuck in copies of the books to the, his niece, copy of Luther's books to his nieces. The nieces shared those books with Catherine. And then they decided they wanted to, to verify uh, what, is this true what Luther says that the Bible says? And so they went, they did have a, a Bible in the convent, and they went to the Bible, and these nuns started reading what Luther 
told him the Bible said, and they were shocked, and they agreed and, and concluded he was right. But now what do you do about that? You know, if, if he's right about this, this uh, life is not right, they're not the proper way of doing it, you're stuck in the, in the cloister. And it's very serious offense to help somebody get out of the cloister. Oh, they were. It was, it was, in fact, if you help somebody get out of, a, uh, of the, being a nun, it was punishable by death. It was a serious offense. Anyhow, the nuns studied, studied the word and uh, they wanted the liberty that Christ promised them. Catherine and 11 other nuns decided that uh, they were going to escape. And, um, they, but they had no place to go. So they started writing letters. They, they, the parents refused to help them. The parents put them there. Dr. Von, they thought the Staupitz himself might help them, but he didn't respond. So then they wrote to Luther. It was uh, one of those two uh, girls, I think it was Margaret, that wrote to Luther and asked him to help. And, uh, but liberating a nun was punishable by death, so nobody wanted to help, obviously. This is a little uh, summary of their escape that these women heard loud and clear. In the early morning hours, Easter Day, 1523, 12 nuns fled the convent in Nimshin. A popular legend describes the nuns free in the back of a fish wagon owned by a friend of Luther's. That's only the question, how many nuns fled in the monastery? The evidence points to 12, but only nine nuns arrived in Wittenberg. The other three, obviously got back to their own families because they lived in the region of the Luther friend Frederick the Wise, uh, the Saxon prince. Where... This is uh, what's left of the, the convent at Nimshin. Uh, <coughs> you know, during that, when after Luther pronounced that it was wrong for this monastic life, um, during the peasants' wars, convents and monasteries were just destroyed. Anyhow, this, this sometime uh, over ages has been destroyed, and this is what is left uh, of the monastery, of the convent. They do have a, a reception. They built a new hotel and reception area. So if you want to go visit, there is a uh, place there will welcome you. <clears throat> the uh, Luther got a, they mentioned that video, a friend, it w his name was uh, Leonard Kopp, to help the nuns out. Kopp and his assistant, Tomitash, um, did, made regular de de deliveries of fish to the monastery. So the thought was that seeing them from uh, Wittenberg over there in Gr Grameda will not surprise anybody. So you can, they can get, it's sort of a, a way of, they would be there and uh, delivering fish or something. So the, there are two stories. Uh, yeah. Well, anyhow, it happened on Good, Good Friday, it was from Good Friday till midnight on Saturday, the nuns were expected to pray. At midnight, they could go back to their rooms. That's when they went back to the rooms, and they met in, in uh, uh, Kate, Kate, Kathleen's room because she was the only one that had a, uh, out, a window to the outside. And so they escaped through her window. Oops. And uh, at midnight, uh, they got met, and then they escaped from her window. Uh, there are two stories that escape. Someone says that Krupp came with his wagon and, and the barrels of that he normal carry fish in, and that he came right into the um, convent and picked them up and escaped. The other story is that they escaped through the window and went down 
to the town where he was waiting for them. In any case, uh, they got out of the, the convent. Uh, nobody is really quite sure which of those, if any, if any of them are true. But um, they, by Easter morning, they arrived 20 miles away in the town of Torgau. Torgau was important because that was in the Friedrich the Wise air territory. So they rested in Torgau, and uh, two days later, they made the 20-mile trip from there over to Wittenberg. This is a, graphically, this is where Grimio, the Nimshin was, made it up here, Torgau. Now they're in pretty wise territory, and here's Wittenberg. <coughs> so they arrive in Wittenberg, and Luther now has to take care of these women and find them husbands and find them uh, uh, homes to live and, and work to do it. Uh, Katie became like a, a housekeeper, first for uh, one family, but mo most of the two years that she lived there, she was living in the home of uh, Lucas Kronick, who was a famous uh, artist that lived in Wittenberg. And um, she stayed with them as, um, I don't know if it was au pair or as a cleaning lady or what, but anyhow, that was her life for the first two years. Uh, while she was there, she got to know the King of Denmark, who came to Lucas Kronick's house because he was the artist. And in fact, the King of Denmark gave her a ring at one point while she was living with Lucas Kronick. Um, Luther, during this time, the monastery where he lived had been vacated, the monks left. He still lived in the monastery, but he no longer wore the monk's robes and so forth. He now dressed as a normal priest. The eight of them, in that video, they mentioned that three of the nuns were able to go back to their families in Friedrich Lewis territory. Eight of them um, found husbands sort of quickly, uh, but uh, Catherine remained as the only one that, that didn't have a husband. Now, it wasn't that she didn't, wasn't close to it. She did apparently fall in love with a, a gentleman by the name of Honorarius Baumgartner from Nuremberg. His parents uh, found out about the relationship and called him back to Nuremberg and quickly married him off to somebody they wanted to marry him to. They, they did not want him marrying a, an ex-nun who had no money. And so they found that uh, he paired him up with a, uh, somebody who was in the Nuremberg Council and very wealthy and a, a very nice young lady. And he, after he went home, he, he was going home to tell his parents that, that he was going to marry her. She never heard from him again. Um, rumors had it as how she found out that he had married somebody else. Anyhow, uh, at that point, they were pretty desperate to, to finally find her husband. What they tried to pair her up with another professor at the University of Dr. Glatz, and she refused him. And it was Amsdorf who was trying to convince her to marry Glatz. Amsdorf was a, an older uh, monk and that uh, also was a professor there. And uh, she uh, said that she would only marry, she said to Amsdorf, I'll only marry you or Luther. <laughs> Amsdorf uh, insisted he wasn't going to get married. <laughs> so that left Luther. And sure enough, uh, now part of this was that Luther's friends in the, that he was working with uh, in this Reformation time argued mm -hmm. with him that if he doesn't get married, people won't believe that it's really okay for a priest to marry. So uh, if you want some of the videos I've watched, uh, one uh, man quotes a, a philosopher who said, it didn't, marry who, it didn't matter who Luther married, he could have married the 
the doorpost, but he had to ma get married just to, to prove that it was okay for a priest to get married. So they got married, and two weeks later, the marriage was performed by B Bugenhagen, who was we talked about before, who did a lot of the administrative work for Luther. He was the, the priest at the uh, main church in town in Wittenberg. And two weeks later, they announced their wedding and threw a party to celebrate. One of the sh shocking things that uh, it was a surprise to me, and I think uh, more surprise to Melanchthon, they never informed Melanchthon about this. He was totally surprised, disappointed, and and uh, uninvited. Well, he, 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 I think he was invited to the party, but he wasn't told about the wedding that had occurred two weeks before. This is a picture of Katie uh, that came from that time frame. And if you would read these, please, Wendy. Luther wrote, the best gift of God is a pious and amiable wife who fears God, loves her family, with whom a man may live in peace and in whom he may safely confide. I would not change my Katie for France and Venice because God has given her to me and she is true to me and a good mother. Were all the leaves in the woods of Torgau each given a voice, they would still be too few to sing the praise of marriage and condemn the wickedness of celibacy. And then this is what Katie had to say about him. She wrote, if I had a principality and an empire, it would never have cost me so much pain to lose them as I have now that our dear Lord has taken from me, and not only from me, but from the whole world, this dear and precious man. <coughs> um, she not only was a good wife, as those uh, Luther's quotes there would imply, but she took care of Luther. She became his doctor. She became his psycho psychiatrist and got him through the, the, his illnesses and his depression. <clears throat> when Henry VIII heard of Luther's marriage, he said this. Upon of hearing Luther's marriage, Henry VIII quipped, this, quipped, this is the real reason for the Reformation. <laughs> Uh, after they got married, of course, they had children. And this is a listing of their children. Um, the first was Hans, born in 1525. And uh, one of, we, it's nice that a lot of the letters were from le the letter that um, was quoted there from Katie. We have 26 letters that Katie wrote to Luther when he was away. So that we know quite a bit about their relationship there. Uh, this is a letter that Luther wrote to his son, who was four years old, when Luther was at, and the Augsburg Confession was being written. And Luther couldn't go to Augsburg, but he went to Coburg. And that, while he was at Coburg, he wrote, I'm happy to see that you are studying well and saying your prayers faithfully, your loving Papa. Uh, Hans studied in Torgau and later in Konigsberg, I think it is. Uh, the first daughter, Elizabeth, was born in 1527, and she died uh, shortly thereafter in 1528. The next second da daughter, Magdalena, was born in, in 1528, and she was, she was a child gifted with the Holy Spirit. At age 13, she developed chest pain while at the table and uh, died two weeks later. Uh, unknown reason. Uh, but uh, this, this was a tough thing for Martin. Uh, he, he comments on there that had he, had he been a priest or a monk that couldn't marry, he would have never appreciated the, the pain and sorrow that his parishioners were going through when they lost their children. And here he, he was uh, deeply upset when this happened. 
His second son was Martin, born in 1530. Then a son, Paul, born in 1532, and he became a doctor. Then a daughter, Gretchen, who was also called Margaret, was uh, born in 1534. So they had six children. Had not an easy start. The Prince Elector gave away the monastery as a kind of silent gift, but only a third of the house of that time was habitable. People, especially the prince, expected Luther to move with his wife into some more suitable and uh, more suitable home uh, along the lines Philip Melanchthon got uh, ten years later as a gift. But it was Kate who decided to stay and build the house, set up a household which cannot be compared to anything we normally have today. It's more like a convention center. Uh, coupled with the student's home, uh, sometimes an infirmary, Kathy took over the economic rule of the impossible. Luther had no idea about money <coughs> and what to do with that. Uh, his only idea was to spend it. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> the, uh, I, I hope you notice there the, the garden in front of the, the uh, monastery. Today, that's a a uh, courtyard, but when Katie was there, it, it made sense that it would have been a, a big garden. Um, I'll go into a little bit of that there. Uh, Luther's pay, and the thing about money, and Luther's pay was 200 florins per year, but he spent about 500 florins per year, and uh, Katie had to make up the difference. And um, she raised chickens, ducks, pigs, and cows, uh, with, w which were added to the cloister. And the, um, she kept, a, she had a pond that, you got to really think about it, the, the Elbe River flows next to Wittenberg, and off of the Elbe was a little canal, and it comes right down the center of, of Wittenberg. But at, the, at one point, the canal had a little pond, and that was her pond to raise uh, carp, uh, trout, carp, perch, and um, pike. Uh, she also had an orchard where they grew apples, grapes, pears, and pigs. No, and pigs. I never see pigs in Germany. I don't know. That's what it, it said. <laughs> and and later on, she had. She bought first one farm, or they bought one farm together, and then later on she bought a second farm. And but I think of all those things she did, probably brewing was the most important. She brewed the uh, ale that uh, they drank around the table when they had the table talk. Um, she had Wolfgang and her aunt Lena as helpers. Um, they other, had other paid help, too, I'm sure, be, to do all the things they did. In addition to her six children, she raised ten uh, nephews and nieces. And, um, and four orphans they also took in. Wow. Um, now, and it, the, the monastery, when it was, was uh, fully outfitted, could sleep 40 people. So the others, she ran it out to students. And um, that's how she, uh, she made quite a bit of the money that she made. But she had to feed all those people, too. And uh, so it was quite an undertaking. Um, oh, <laughs> other people uh, would come to stay with them, too. One of them was the wife of the elector of Brandenburg who left him had no place to go, so she moved in with Katie and Martin in the, in the monastery. Uh, Katie was the, uh, the only woman, oh, at Luther's table talk, it was for men only and Katie. She, she would, and um, in fact, not all the men approved of Katie being there. Um, they, some complained that she was too outspoken and, and uh, that Luther should control her. Uh, <laughs> and Luther ap apparently uh, just uh, 
swallowed hard and ignored that. Yeah. <laughs> Katie provided a um, refuge to all the nuns and monks that were leaving their, their monasteries too at the time. Um, she it says, it talks about herbs and poultices that are used to, to cure skin or, or hurt muscle problems. But she really became like a doctor. And uh, Paul later on says she was a good doctor. Oh, yeah. Paul, Paul who became a doctor, said her, his mother was a good doctor. Um, she, the time for doctoring became important. The Black Plague hit Wittenberg twice um, in the last seven years of her life. And she cared for the, the sick people during the plague as well. And <coughs> Wolfgang, who was with Luther, ever, uh, I, I don't know how it works, but anyhow, Luther had a servant when he was a monk, and his servant was Wolfgang, and Wolfgang stayed with Luther all his life. And Wolfgang, uh, at once, one time, uh, on the issue of, of money, uh, had an argument with Luther and condemned him for not providing for his family. And uh, Luther replied, that I will never do. Otherwise, they would put their not put, otherwise they would put their trust not in God, but in their possessions. And to them, they, their hearts would cling. So Luther did not feel it was a, a responsibility or something he ought to do. So, uh, so Katie did have to provide. Gifts were, Luther, when prominent people would give Luther gifts, and he would promptly give them away to anybody, uh, needy or otherwise. One, one time somebody came by and said, oh, that's a beautiful vase. And he said, oh, here, have it. And it was a vase that was with lot, worth lots of money. Um, it, it just uh, seemed to be something he didn't want to concern himself with. <coughs> <clears throat> Luther's cousin owned a farm called Zulzdorf, and his cousin fell into debt and ne needed to sell the farm. So Luther and Katie, did, Katie wanted the farm very much. Uh, it pointed out, as a, as a nobleman, nobleman needed land. That was part of the, the idea of being a nobleman, you had land, and she wanted land. And... Um, so when th this became available, um, oh, did I go? Uh, they went to John Friedrich, and uh, he loaned them the money to buy the farm. Um, Katie renovated the, the farmhouse so that it was suitable for their living, and um, Luther, in his will, he writes. Uh, normally, the will would go to the, either the oldest son or the youngest son. Luther gave all of his estate to Katie, partly because she was the motivation behind it, but also that, that uh, he had that much trust in her that she could take care of. It. Not all the, the lawyers and, and other people that were surrounding Luther agreed with his will, uh, and that caused some problems later on. Uh, Luther tells Kate, oh, this is during that time period. Remember when Luther got upset with the people of Wittenberg were still, were still continued to sin, and he was so frustrated. He told Katie he's got to retire to Zulzdorf, and he did for a couple months or for a short period of time. And, but, and she was so happy at that time that, they, that he was retiring. But in, in shortly thereafter, he was called back to Wittenberg. Then Luther, uh, what is it? Mediate. Oh, had to mediate between the inheritance dispute of the Council of Man Mansfield, and he decided he would do that. And then uh, Luther visited Eisleben as we went over last week, and he died. Um, this is just a brief 
Weeks before his death in Eisleben, Luther shared news of his declining health. My dearly beloved mistress of the house, Katharina Luther, a doctor, the lady of Zollesdorf and of the pig market, and whatever else she is capable of being, before all else, grace and peace in Christ, and my old, poor, and as your grace knows, powerless love, your loving Martin Luther, who has grown old. Katharina was... So he died, and uh, as I said, he, they, um, he had to implement his will. And basically, Katie got most of the things where they, they had trouble with um, the uh, normally the young kids that were not of age had to have a, a guardian appointed to them. And so that Katie was not allowed to be the guardian of, of her kids. They appointed uh, other people who were in charge of the education of the kids. Only Margaret, who was 10 years old, I think at the time, was allowed to stay with Katie. Anyhow, this that uh, shows that, that what um, Zulsdorf, of course, continued with her, and then the other dis distribution of the, his of their wealth. Uh, I didn't. Well, they also had a, a stipend from the king of Denmark. He gave her a gift of 500 ducats, which is quite a bit, and a, a monthly or yearly allowance. Um, Hans continued his studies. Uh, Paul, uh, Martin and Paul were tutored by Amsdorf and Rudfeld. Anyhow, the kids were uh, all apportioned out, and uh, good... No, good uh, what does it say? guardians were appointed. Charles V uh, continued his pursuit of the Lutherans, and uh, when they when Charles V's army got close, uh, the um, I think I must have skipped one there. No. Anyhow, uh, oh yeah, Duke Maurice of Saxony switched sides and and uh, was enticed to go against his uh, his cousin John Fr Frederick. The small called League formed their man. They had four thousand seven hundred men in their army, and Charles only had nine thousand men in his army. So this looked like the small called League could protect them. Um, when they were getting close to battle, Katie and many other people from Wittenberg fled. They went north. Um, she went as far as Magdeburg. And then uh, they found out that the uh, attack didn't occur, so they came back. And she returns to Wittenberg. And then it gets close to the attack again, and she flees again to Magdeburg. In, uh, in desperation, uh, she decides she needs to go to Denmark because the king of Denmark had been so good to her. But the, it was impossible. She tried every way you can think of getting out of Germany and up to Denmark, and it was, there was no way she could do it. But while she was in Magdeburg, at, uh, an inn, a man told her that uh, Lucas Kronick was able to save Wittenberg. That when Charles came into Wittenberg, somehow Cronick convinced him that he didn't want to, shouldn't destroy it. And so she was able to go back to Wittenberg after Charles had conquered it. And um, the, there had been damage done to the, the uh, monastery, so she had to repair that. And uh, the, the uh, more. Duke Maurice, who now was had conquered all of Saxony, he had to pay for the cost of the army that he had raised. And the way to pay for it is to put a tax on the landowners of the people that were under John Frederick. 
And so she, he put a tax on Zulzorf and she had bought another p piece of property uh, next to Zulzdorf called Wachdorf. Rock, and the tax on both of them essentially bankrupted her. She, had, she could not pay the tax and she had to give up her property. And, uh, and now she was destitute. Um, she collected all the trinkets and all the gifts that they had collected over time and sold them and she was able to raise 200 florin, which was from you see before the, that was a yearly salary for Luther. Um, with that, she was able to restore part of the, the uh, closer um, to offer room and board for, other, for students. And that got her into where she could make a little income again, but it still wasn't very much. She was able to raise enough money to, uh, for Hans to go to the University of uh, Konigsberg and finish his education. And uh, Hans later served in the, both the Saxon government and the uh, uh, Prussian government. Uh, Melanchthon and Bugenhagen <coughs> tried to intercede to, to, with the king of Denmark to get her uh, the money that he, she had been promised. And um, they couldn't get through to him. She even tried to write to the king of Denmark and uh, no response. To John Friedrich um, <coughs> had been wounded and taken prisoner. He had been, Charles V had condemned him to death, but they didn't kill him. And, uh, but he was condemned to death and was able still to inspire his people from the prison. Uh, John, uh, Charles V makes an offer to John Frederick and, um, to restore all and pay for all the restoration of Saxony if John Friedrich would just accept the Catholic papers from Augsburg. John Friedrich demonstrates incredible faith and refuses and stays in prison and does not accept the Catholic position at Augsburg. <clears throat> he wrote a psalm while he was in prison and that psalm became the inspiration in Germany. And I'm sorry to say I look everywhere to try and find what the psalm was that he had written, and I couldn't find it. But it uh, was what had inspired the people. And um, so he continued in prison at this time. The secretary to the king of Denmark happened to be in Torgau, and they, uh, they talked to him, and he said the king never received their request, and that he would take care of it. So he went about his way back to Denmark. Hopefully, now she was going to be taken care of. Catherine wrote again, and the secretary carried her text back to the king. <clears throat> and this is a, a quote that she had from her. I thank thee for all, all the trials to which thou didst lead me. Um, this was late in her life. She was uh, uh, obviously under a lot of stress. In the summer of 1552, the plague hit, plague hit Wittenberg again. This it wasn't the COVID plague. This was the Black Plague carried by fleas on, on rodents. And at that time, they didn't know what caused the Black Plague. Um, but uh, she, the first time the plague came, she took everybody into the convent and, and took care of them and nobody died. This time again, she took people in and, for five weeks and then somebody died. And that scared her. Now the Black Plague was there and, and she couldn't deny it. She put her family in a wagon and uh, left town. Left for, went to Tor, uh, towards Torgau. <coughs> The horses were unruly. Then a barking dog caused the horses to panic and run out of control. They, the ho horses couldn't be stopped, 
So Catherine jumped from the wagon, and she jumped at the wrong time. They were just going past a stream. She rolled down embankment and hit her head, and uh, it was wet and cold, and uh, they, they were able to get her back into the wagon and take her to Torgau. Uh, two hours later, they arrived in Torgau, and they put her to bed. She was weak and had a fever, and a fever had set in. Shortly thereafter, she died. And so the, uh, what a tragic ending to a great lady's wife. So that, with that, I will close in, in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for enabling the Luther family. Thank you for helping them through their heartaches of raising a family. Help all parents to share your love with their children. Help each of us to know that you alone are our source of strength. Please help us, help us to rely on, only on your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Gary. So there was a song at the beginning of this name, Life is Yes. Oh, Psalm yes. 31, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah.